Welcome to WPI. I'm Professor Norton. We're in the Dynamics Lab, and I'm going to give you a brief demonstration of this four-bar linkage demonstrator machine, which we use in some of our classes. This was designed and built some years ago, I think in 1990, by two students as their senior project, and we've used it ever since. I'll give you a little description of what it is, and then we'll run it for you and show you what it does. It's a four-bar linkage, as I said. It's essentially a do-nothing machine. It doesn't have any particular purpose except as a demonstrator. So it does no useful work. We have the base link, typically called link one, is the frame. This is the pivot for link two, turning against link one. So you would call that instance center two one or one two. It's also typically labeled O2 as the fixed pivot in your textbook. This would be O4 over here, the fixed pivot of link 4. And that could also be called instance center 4-1 or I-4-1. This pivot right here, a moving pivot, is between link 2 and link 3, which is the coupler. So this would be labeled instance center 2-3. At the other end of the coupler, link 3 couples to link 4, which is here. So this is instance center 3-4. And that completes the, the four bar linkage. Link two, three, and four are the moving links. Link one is the fixed link. On the coupler, we have at a, an arbitrarily chosen coupler point placed a couple of accelerometers. You see one in the y direction and one in the x direction. And recognize that those y's and x's are in a local rotating coordinate system, the x axis for which runs from one pivot of link three to the other. This line, of course, defines the kinematic link three just as this line right here defines the kinematic line two, this is just excess baggage to provide a center of gravity that is not on the line of centers of the link, just for generality. Likewise, the center of gravity of this link is not on the line of centers. Same being true of link four. There's other instrumentation on this as well. A little hard to see from the current angle, but we will zoom in on that momentarily to give you a better look but there are two force transducers of the piezoelectric variety, and they are located on the shaft, this being the shaft that drives the linkage. Um, and we're measuring separately the X direction force, which we would call F12X, and the Y direction force. You can see the red wire over here going to the uh, Y directed transducer. The X directed transducer is somewhat hidden. What you're looking at here is one of the four force transducers that is um, on the system. This is measuring the y-directed force in the 1-2 uh, position, that is the shaft between link 1 and link 2, which is right here. That shaft is supported in a bearing, which you can see here. That bearing, in turn, is in a block. You can't see the pivot for that block, which is off camera to the left. That block is free to potentially rotate about its pivot in the up and down direction on this side, and that potential rotation is taken out to ground by this transducer. These transducers are sensitive only to one direction, this being the vertical direction in this case. So it's measuring only Y-directed force. This wire takes the signal out to the analyzer that you saw earlier. Same arrangement on the other side. Down here is a transducer measuring the Y-direction force at F14 and hidden behind it is one in the x direction to measure the x component of that force. So you're looking now at an end view of the um, link 4 end of the linkage. So this is the pivot shaft for link 4. So that would be O4 in my terminology or instance center 1, 4. And you'll notice here that it is supported as a beam in two locations as you simply supported beam. So we have a support back here and a support here. And the way the transducers are arranged, you can see the Y transducer under here. That is in the position closer to the linkage. The linkage plane is actually here. Um, and notice also that the linkage is not completely in one plane as we assume it to be theoretically. The links have to be stacked on top of one another in order to pass over as they rotate. So we are generating force in the linkage plane, and we're measuring force in the y direction in this plane, and we're measuring force in the x direction, in this case, in this plane over here. That needs to be taken into account when you try to compare the forces that are measured with the forces that are predicted theoretically 
to exist in the linkage plane. So we have essentially six measurements, and down here you can see the panel where these uh, measurements are brought out. This is an amplifier for those transducers, so we have F12X, F12Y, F14X, F14Y, acceleration in the X direction, acceleration in the Y direction. Now, I mentioned that the acceleration is in this rotating coordinate system, but the forces are in the global coordinate system, which, of course, uh, in the book is typically set up with the x-axis running through the two fixed pivots and the origin at the driving link, which is link 2. So the y-axis would be here for the global y, labeled capital Y in the book, capital X. This whole thing is driven by a motor, which is also somewhat out of sight, but we'll show you a close-up of that in a moment. Uh, the motor is mounted in back of link 2. It is what's referred to as a gear motor. It's purchased with a gear head already on it. In this particular case, it's a worm and wheel, single reduction worm drive, and it is, I think, 33 to 1 reduction. The motor is a DC speed controlled motor. I have a knob down here with which I can change the speed. Right now, I have it set to run at 60 RPM or 1 revolution per second. This is the, the Baldor DC speed control motor, uh, which is, I think, only a f about a fourth of a horsepower. Um, the output shaft of the motor is inside this housing, and sitting on that shaft, and not visible inside the housing, is a worm. A worm, you may recall, is pretty much like a threaded screw, and that in turn is engaged with a, what's called a worm wheel, which is inside this portion of the housing, and that worm wheel is on the output shaft. That gives a 33 to 1 reduction, uh, reducing the motor speed by that factor, and also, of course, increasing the torque by the same factor. So we have a large value of torque available to drive the input shaft to the linkage. I will move that back and forth so you can see in this close-up view the degree of backlash. And notice also that the clacking that you're hearing, first of all, is the gear teeth hitting one another as I move them back and forth across the backlash interface. But if you look at the coupling right here, you can also see this backlash in the coupling because the blue um, filler piece that's made of a hard plastic that I mentioned before is uh, not a tight fit between the two metal pieces. This metal piece is attached to the output shaft of the gearbox, and this metal piece is attached to the input shaft of the linkage. And they are coupled by reason of these dogs, so-called, which are interfering with one another, separated by this uh, shock-absorbing material. So you can see a combination of backlash in the coupling, and you can hear the backlash in the gears. The motor output shaft from the gearbox, which is on the head of the motor, is coupled to the input shaft of the linkage, which is this shaft here, by a flexible coupling, also hidden from your view in this particular angle, but we'll show you a close-up of that as well. Uh, and that allows for some misalignment between the shaft of the motor and the shaft of the linkage, which is inevitable when you assemble anything of the, even this limited complexity. Okay, what you're looking at here is the coupling between the motor's output shaft, actually the gearbox output shaft, and the input shaft to the crank. And you can see some little blue things moving around there. That's a plastic insert in between two metal pieces that act more or less like the knuckles of your two hands. If you put your two hands together with your knuckles and move one with the other with some plastic in between your knuckles, you would have that coupling. Uh, and the presence of that plastic piece gives it some flexibility so that if my two arms were not perfectly aligned, then uh, it would still turn. That's its function. I showed you how the four-bar machine has a coupling in it connecting the motor output shaft to the linkage input shaft of what I referred to as a spider type. I have in my hand such a coupling. It was difficult for you to see with it in the machine exactly how it's constructed, so I thought it would be useful for you to see this uh, separated, and I can take it apart for you very easily. So my two fingers represent the two shafts that are being coupled. And if we were to disassemble it, pull it apart like so, one shaft is attached to that, the other shaft is attached to that, and connecting the two elements of the coupling is this item that I refer to as a spider. 
It's made of some relatively soft material. This appears to be a, some combination of cloth and plastic. I'm not sure exactly what it's made of. The one in the four bar machine is a, just a solid plastic. And you can buy these with various types of spiders, ranging all the way from metal, if you want a very stiff coupling, to fairly soft, rubbery type plastic. So the coupling assembles by simply putting that together. Notice also, let me take that apart a second, these are the same identical part. And it's always good design if you can use the same part twice, because I'm going to have to create tooling to make this. And if I make twice as many, I wash the tooling cost twice as fast. So that's a, a nice design advantage here. Same part used twice. Sit the spider in there. Rotate this to the appropriate location. Put it together. Some set screws are provided to attach it to the shaft. Actually, not the best means of attaching to a shaft. Better to have a key, perhaps, or a double D. But be that as it may, this can be used to connect two shafts, and it allows some misalignment of this type. That's angular misalignment. It allows a very little bit of this kind of misalignment, sideways misalignment. And it allows a fair bit of axial misalignment, which is to say, not in the same place axially. The one item I haven't described yet is the shaft encoder, which is on the very back of the motor shaft. Actually, it's on the gearbox output shaft. On the and that shaft encoder is coupled, as you can see, through a flexible coupling to the output shaft. This is a double-ended gearbox, so it has two sides to its output shaft. The side opposite this is driving the linkage, but it's the same physical shaft. So this is going to measure rotational position of this shaft. And it gives me a pulse once per revolution. It also gives me a train of pulses. I think this particular one is 1,024 pulses per revolution, which I can use as a tachometer. I'm not making use of that in this particular case. I'm just using the once per pulse to start my measurements. It serves as a trigger to begin taking data with my force transducers. So I think I'll turn it on now and let you see and hear what it does. And I would encourage you as young engineers to use your, all of your senses to try to determine what this linkage is doing. Now you can see and hear some anomalies in its motion. There's a very loud clicking sound. I'm going to later ask you to uh, try to figure out what might be causing that, and I'll give you some hints along the way. And if you look very carefully at the crank, which is link two, you may be able to detect that it's got some hesitation in its motion. And I can emphasize that or exaggerate it if I slow this down. You can very clearly see a hesitation right there and again there. So twice per revolution. I want to show you something else, and this is going to get a little bit noisy. I'm going to turn this up to full speed for a short period of time. And I want you to look uh, at the overall assembly, including the cart. So you need to be able to see the whole assembly. I'm going to hold the pencil fairly still so you can see the relative motion between the cart and the pencil stop the agony there before it blows itself up. Now, I'm going to turn it back to about the 60 RPM position that we started with. Now, where's all this noise coming from? Well, if you, ha if you were here and could put your hands on this thing to investigate it, you might decide to come up and uh, put this in a little better position. And with it off, I have the emergency lockout engaged now so it cannot run. So it's safe for me to put my hands in there. This has a safety shield which is currently up. But if I grab this input crank, notice how much motion is possible. And also notice a sound that is not dissimilar to what you heard while it ran. Now any gear train, and a worm and wheel in particular, has a, an issue called backlash, which refers to the clearance in, the, in between the gears. And worms and wheels are notorious for having large backlash. The backlash allows some relative motion, as you can see. I can move that crank 
oh, probably three or four degrees without turning the motor. The motor is not turning at the present time. At least I hope it's not. I'll lose my hands if it does. Uh, so this sloppiness in the gear train, which is inherent to an inexpensive gear train, which this is, you could pay more money and get a gear train with much less backlash if you so desired. But this one is fairly inexpensive. So that gives me problems. When I analyze this linkage, as you've done in your classes or will do, uh, you assume that the crank speed is constant with time. And that would be an ideal situation if we could obtain that. But obviously, I'm going to have some error in that constancy of speed with this backlash problem. Now, I'm going to move now over to the computer where I have running program 4-bar. We're looking here at the animation screen in program 4-bar, and I've put in on the left side the link lengths for this particular linkage and the couple of point location in polar coordinates, the distance and the angle. <coughs> and also, uh, on a separate screen, I told it what the masses, the moments of inertia are and where the CGs are located. So these little circles represent the centers of gravity of the links. This curve represents the coupler curve generated by the point at which we have the accelerometers. So there is the simulation of this linkage in 4-bar. And if I move now to a plot screen, I can show you some of the data that you would expect uh, to see on your measurements if it were perfect, which of course it is not. So what we were measuring on the machine itself was um, acceleration of the coupler point was one item. So if I bring that up here, we could see nice smooth curves here. And uh, I mean, if you look at the files that are with this lab, you'll see some measurements made of the actual acceleration, which will look quite a bit different. Let me show you a force. We looked, I think, at the force of uh, one on four, which would be this guy. And here again, we see a relatively smooth curve. And you saw on another screen on the analyzer something that looked a good bit different than this, but purports to be the same measurement. This is in the x direction, this is in the y direction. Now getting back to the issue of this cart moving, as an engineer you might wonder what caused that to move. This machine is doing no work. I'm taking no energy away from the machine to do anything useful. It is just going around in circles or in coupler curves as the case may be. So to illustrate this issue, I'm going to switch the plot over here to show us, if I can find it, shaking force. Now if you've read that section of the book yet, you, will, you should know that shaking force is defined as the sum of all the forces acting on the ground plane. In this case it would be the sum of force 1, 2 and the 1, 4, vectorially summed. Okay? And here you see that it is going positive and negative, positive again over here. Um, this is in the x direction, horizontal on the cart y direction up, down on the cart. And I asked you to consider why the cart did not move up when, in fact, you did see it move left and right in response to that shaking force. And the one other thing I want to show you here in the theoretical plots is the torque. And there we have it. So now you're looking at the theoretical torque of 1 versus 2, which was effectively the motor turning the input crank to the shaft. And again, you see it going positive, negative, positive, negative. Uh, two positives and two negatives per revolution. This is one complete revolution of the crank. And thus, you see the, the, the reason for that backlash take up when it reverses from positive to negative twice per cycle. I mentioned before that there are some transducers on this machine. And one of the things we use it for in our courses is to demonstrate to the students that life is not always what the theory predicts. Now, these curves that you're looking at in program 4-bar are theoretical. They assume everything is perfect. For example, that the speed is constant. They also assume that, assume that there is no sloppiness in the system, that there is no vibration. So they are giving you one picture of what could be if you had the perfect machine. But no machine is perfect. So what we're going to do next is show you the results of actual measurements of the forces here and there 
and also the accelerations. And to do that, I've coupled this up to an analyzer. This is, device is called a dynamic signal analyzer. It's essentially a digital oscilloscope with a lot of extra features. And you can see that I have wires coming from the output ports for the various forces and accelerations over there. Here you're looking at the analyzer screen, and the two traces being displayed are on the top trace, the force at pivot 1-4 in the x-direction, and on the bottom trace, the same location in the y-direction. And it's taking data, so you see the screen update every time it takes a new trace. And you'll see slight differences from trace to trace, indicating that it's not a perfectly stationary system. I can turn on averaging, in which case it will take, in this particular setup, 10 averages and then stop. It will average them together, which will remove any spurious noise that might occur by my stamping my foot on the floor or a heavy truck driving by outside the laboratory, something that is not periodic and not uh, due to the rotational motion of the machine will be effectively zeroed out uh, due to the averaging. And you end up with a cleaner signal. So we can presume, having done the averaging, that our signals are representative of the machine in this current condition. The averaging is now complete, and you're looking at a signal that has come to rest. I think if you compare those to the theoreticals, if you can look back at this for a moment, this is what the theory says we should have for F14. And notice that in a very crude sense, the X component has one fairly significant positive going hump, uh, returning nearly to zero, and then another positive going hump, and then a small negative going hump. And if we just look at that as an example, that's the F14X. And we compare that to what I see over here. It doesn't look at all like the theoretical. Here I see a, lot, a bunch of smaller humps. I see some general tendency to go up and back down again. and never really comes back down to zero. And then I have this little oscillation over here where something else is happening. So this is reality. This is theory. And the question I pose to you as a student is, why is the reality different than the theory? I'll later give you some questions that you can specifically address in that regard. So I've shown you a little bit about how this operates. And I'm going to come back to this in another video somewhat later after I make some modifications to this linkage to improve its operation. And we'll see what effects those have. So I'm going to leave you here and present to you on the disk with this video a list of questions and some additional information on the dimensions and the parameters of this linkage so that if your instructor wishes you to do so, you can attempt to do a virtual laboratory along the same lines as that which I have my students do here at WPI. Thank you. We'll see you later. Welcome back to the uh, WPI Dynamics Lab. I'm Professor Norton, and we're here a few days after we made the previous video of this machine to show you some improvements we've made to it. I'm going to point out the improvements first, and then we'll run the machine, and you'll see and hear the difference quite quickly, I think. Several things have been done since you saw it last. One of the things has been to add balance weights to links 2 and link 4. Now, these are calculated by what's called the Birkhoff lowen method of linkage balancing, and that's covered in your chapter 13 of Design of Machinery. And if you are studying that in class, then you should understand what the mathematics is of that. But in essence, what it does is uh, calculate the location and the mass of balance weights that are necessary to place on the two rotating links, being the crank and the rocker, that fully compensate for the dynamic forces in all of the three moving links. That is, these are compensating for the coupler's motion as well. In effect, their addition takes the global center of gravity of the entire linkage to a particular point and holds it stationary. And if the global center of gravity of the linkage does not move while the linkage turns, then of course you don't have any mass times acceleration force. And that's what was causing the cart to move when we ran this last time. A second change that's been made is to add a flywheel to the input shaft in order to help smooth out the torque variations. 
We talked last time about how the oscillations in torque were causing the backlash in the gearbox to be taken up one way and then the other, this causing a fair bit of noise and also impact to the system. If we can quiet down that oscillation in the torque, we will reduce those impacts. It's not a terribly large flywheel. Uh, if you've studied uh, that topic in your textbook, you'll know that the uh, moment of inertia of the flywheel is what determines how effective it is. And this does have some effect, but it's not as much as one could uh, achieve with a larger flywheel. Another change that has been made, which uh, you can't see but we'll show you in a close-up later on, is that coupling that I showed you last time that had so much slop or backlash in it as well has been replaced with a tight coupling. It's a rigid coupling that has no compliance whatsoever. So that's the best I can do to couple the torque from one part of the system to the other, namely the motor output shaft to the input shaft of the linkage. You can see in this close-up the, uh, the change to the coupling that I mentioned. In effect, what I've done is put a shroud over the existing coupling. It's a homemade rigid coupling split in two pieces. In fact, I'll stop this so you can see the two pieces, then I'll run it again. You can see the split right there and a couple of screws holding it together. So this is, in essence, clamping the two halves of the um, spider type coupling that is still present underneath it and taking out its compliance. So I now have the output shaft of the motor rigidly connected to the input shaft of the linkage. I'll turn it back on so you can see that there is no, well, maybe it is hard to see at that speed, but there's no relative motion within the coupling. You can see the motor jiggling over here and that's because I have the motor now on those battery mounts which are flexible and allow the errors in shaft angle and position here to be accommodated by the motor itself moving with respect to the ground plane. As with everything in engineering, it comes with a price. And the price is that any misalignment of the shaft is going to be exacerbated uh, and show up as fairly large forces in the bearings of the uh, linkage shafts if I have a tight coupling that is trying to be in different places at either end at the same time. And there is some shaft misalignment. So to accommodate that, I've put the compliance at a different location. If you look down here underneath the motor, I don't remember if I pointed it out last time, but the motor in our previous ex uh, experiment was hard bolted to the base of the machine. So I had stanchions in here where I'm pointing that uh, simply fastened the motor tightly to the base. And I've taken those out and hidden behind them all the time were these commercially available vibration isolation mounts, often called Barry mounts after their original inventor, though there are many other companies that make them now. These are, in fact, Barry brand mounts. There are four of those supporting the motor's weight to the base plate, and those are of a combination of rubber and metal. So it's essentially placed this motor base on springs, rubber springs in this case. That allows the motor base to move a little bit as the shaft misalignment uh, is taken up. Those are the changes that we've made, the total of four. Added balance weights, putting it in theoretically perfect force balance, not moment balance, but force balance. Added a flywheel to smooth the torque, reduce the peak oscillations in the torque function. Eliminated the backlash issues with the coupling, but not with the gearbox. That has not been changed. So we still have the same issues of backlash in the worm drive. And we have introduced compliance in the motor mounting system to compensate for our taking out the compliance in the torsional coupling. So let's run the machine and see what happens. I, I've got it running now at about the same speed we did before, which was 60 RPM one cycle per second. I know that aural memory is not very good, so you may not remember what it sounded like before, but you can always review that tape. And I think if you do that, you'll agree that it's much quieter now than it was before. I can still hear that backlash getting taken up each time the torque reverses, but it's much less loud than before. 
Now if you can look down here at the Moda base plate, I'll hold my pen as still as I can and that will give you some sense of how much motion there is in that plate. That's the motor mount essentially responding to the misalignment of the shaft as the thing turns. You can't really see the effects of the balance weights or the flywheel, at least at this speed, until I show you some traces on the analyzer, which I'll do in a few minutes. But what I'm going to do now is the same thing I did with the other setup. I'm going to crank this up to full speed, which I did before in the earlier part of this tape. And when I do that, you'll notice the difference. First of all, it's nowhere near as loud as it was at full speed before. And again, I'll try to hold my hand as steady as possible over here to give you a visual reference. And if you remember what that cart was doing before, it was moving back and forth about a fourth of an inch left to right. And now it's moving virtually not at all. And the reason for that is that I have canceled the shaking force completely with this Burkhoff low and balancing technique. I'm going to turn that back down to a more reasonable speed before that worm drive beats itself to death. I do want this to last a few years. I'm going to move now over to the analyzer so that you can see what these curves look like under this new condition. All right, here we're looking at the analyzer screen, the same analyzer we looked at before with the four bar linkage machine in a different configuration. And right now I've got the force at um, pivot 2-1, which is the crank pivot, in the X direction on the top trace and in the Y direction on the bottom trace. And those, you'll, if you look back at the others, you'll see look quite different now than they did before. Now I should point out also that I think there's a little difference in the way I'm displaying these from the previous time. I've got two full revolutions, or just about two full revolutions showing here. I have a two second time window and as you know we're running this at 60 RPM which is a one second period. So I have two cycles approximately and you can see the repeat. There you see some kind of a disturbance that very rapid change in force indicates something happened, probably the backlash, and here you see it appearing again. So if you wish to determine the speed of this machine under the present conditions, and you had these data, which you do have on your disk, you can uh, simply go in and query how many seconds there are between those two peaks. That is the period of your revolution of the machine. If you've looked at the four bar program version of these forces, you will recognize that these still don't look very much like the theoreticals. And that's one of the purposes of this experiment, is to point out to you as a fledgling engineer that things ain't always as they seem in the theoretical world. So real machines make noise, and we have plenty of evidence of that here. I'm going to switch the display now to two other transducers. I'm listening now to the two accelerometers, which we also looked at before. And I see somewhat cleaner and more quiet curves here, but they still don't look an awful lot like the theoreticals. If your instructor has you do this as a lab exercise, then, uh, and if he does what I would do and do do with my students, um, I would have you do a comparison between these actual curves and the theoretical ones and try to figure out A, what the differences are and B, why they're occurring. So here we have acceleration in the X direction and here we have acceleration in the Y direction. Now remember that X and Y here are in a local rotating coordinate system embedded in the link and program 4 bar does allow you to output your acceleration data in that form, a reference to that rotating coordinate system, so you want to be sure that you compare them to the right uh, data from program 4 bar. So as I said, I'm going to provide data from this experiment and from the other experiment on the disk with this video as well as uh, 4 bar files so you can do this experiment if your instructor so desires. If you do so, 
Have fun.